Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this week's Ed, uh, SEDS online webinar. My name is Shraddha Menon. Uh, before we get started with today's session, uh, we would like to thank our sponsorship from IAS, which allows us to offer all of these resources free of charge. Make sure and check out our website for more info on upcoming events and meetings and to see everything available for the community. Uh, today's talk is by Dr. Robert Hanford, consulting sedimentologist and affiliate faculty at the Colorado School of Mines, USA. His distinguished career has been diverse, notably as a research geologist at Arco Oil and Gas, as well as assistant professor at the University of Arkansas. He specializes in a range of topics, including carbonate depositional systems, facies analysis, and sequence stratigraphy. He is well known for his expertise in Mississippian carbonate and siliciclastic sedimentology across the shelf margin from Oklahoma to Alabama and Kentucky. In today's talk, he'll delve into the giant um, sediment wave field and supercritical flow bed forms in a Mississippian carbonate ramp, Tennessee, Kentucky, USA. And with a short introduction, I would like to hand over the forum to Robert. Okay, well, thanks very much for that introduction and I appreciate the opportunity to speak virtually to everyone today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Well, SEDS Online is a really wonderful platform for communicating with the sedimentology community. And so I, I wanna extend my gratitude to Stephen, uh, Joanna and IAS for establishing and promoting SEDS Online. So <clears throat> as you can see from this uh, title slide, uh, those are some amazing carbonates uh, exposed behind this be really beautiful waterfall. And so there's an antiform structure here, but it's not structure. It's all stratigraphy and depositional systems. And so this is just really one of many large scale sediment waves that are present in this Mississippian ramps. And it really begs the question, how many of us have ever encountered a ramp with large sediment waves, uh, anti dunes or cyclic steps? Uh, not me. And so this is clearly not the type of, of carbonate ramp that I learned about many years ago. So today I'd, I'd really like to, to show you a, a distally steepened carbonate ramp uh, that's Mississippian age in the Fort Payne Formation in Tennessee and Kentucky. And sediment waves and gullies are the dominant architectural elements in the climate them four sets and bottom sets. I think there's uh, plenty of evidence for supercritical flows that passed across the slope and down into the basin. And the drivers were likely sediment gravity flows. I think that there's from some indirect evidence for saline density flows or cascade flows. And, and then I suspect too that there is some contour current reworking of the sediments too. So this is really quite a different type of system than I've ever seen before. And I think there's some implications for examining and interpreting carbonate slopes going forward. Well, I think that probably all of you like me over the past decade or so, we have been amazed to see images derived from multi-beam bathymetric surveys and sub-bottom profiles of marine slopes and basin floors really around the world. And they show that sediment waves are common and uh, they're, they're occurring in confined, unconfined areas of marine slopes. Uh, and they all seem to have this, this characteristic of showing evidence for upslope migration and upflow migration, many of them as cyclic steps. They all have been interpreted as likely having formed from turbidity currents, especially in siliciclastic sediments and in the Bahamas, interpreted as having formed from density cascade flows with each of these uh, types of systems alternating between fruit supercritical and fruit subcritical conditions across hydraulic jumps. Now, they're widely recognized in the, in the modern, but there are very few of these that are recognized in the ancient rock record, uh, especially carbonates. So this, this is a part where I should show uh, an equation or two, how do you calculate uh, what the fruit number is, but I'm, I'm a very poor mathematician, and so I look at it really from a more practical point of view. I found this diagram recently. It, uh, it comes from a, a, uh, an engineering publication, and it shows the dangers of supercritical flows, hydraulic jumps associated with low head dams. And so that's how I look at it. I used to be a whitewater kayaker, and so I have had up close and personal connection to hydraulic jumps 
in and out of a boat. So the idea is that as a flow approaches the crest and down a chute, it accelerates so that supercritical flow is, is developed. Inertial forces are greater than gravity forces and it speeds, speeds up, becomes an erosion prone. And at the bottom of that chute, the, uh, the flow decelerates very rapidly, uh, loses momentum and turns into a subcritical flow associated with a hydraulic jump. And then most interestingly, interestingly even in this uh, engineering diagram, they show the deposition of sediment that, of course, represents the backset beds that is one of the hallmarks of uh, supercritical flows and hydraulic jumps. So I thought that this was a very practical way to show how I look at, uh, at uh, supercritical flows. Uh, and so we look for these in the rock record. Now, that's for an open channel system. But what about uh, uh, in, in, in the submerged flows? There have been some really pioneering laboratory flume studies by, by these folks listed here who have created cyclic steps from submerged density flows that alternate between supercritical and subcritical conditions uh, at hydraulic jumps. Now, Bryce Hand uh, used pulverized uh, charcoal in some of his experiments, and others have used uh, low-density plastic particles as well as uh, natural sand. And it's my understanding that these were all, uh, the sediment was entrained. They, they never really created true sediment gravity flows, but the, 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 the flows were really uh, not true gravity flows, but they entrained the sediment and never reached auto suspension. And so they're not uh, exactly like what we think we see in some natural conditions, but nonetheless, these kinds of experiments are creating the kinds of sedimentary structures and bed forms we see in the rock record and they're helping uh, bridge the gap between observations in the field and in theory. Well, there, there are a number of different types of bed forms associated with uh, supercritical and subcritical flow, like cyclic steps uh, that are created uh, by you know, association with hydraulic jumps. And I think it's fair to say that their recognition in the field uh, can be really challenging, especially where the flow direction relative to an outcrop is uncertain. And if you have 10 geologists on the outcrop looking at these rocks, there's likely to be more disagreement than agreement on whether these are actually supercritical flow structures. And if they are, what type of features are we looking at? Unstable or stable anti-dunes, chutes and pools, or cyclic steps. But regardless of the uncertainties, I think that uh, most people tend to agree that subaqueous uh, subcrit supercritical flows are widespread, uh, they're very frequent, and they're easily attained. Uh, the flow conditions, supercritical flow conditions, are reached at uh, lower velocities uh, in submarine conditions and in, in open channels because of the low density contrast between the density flows and the ambient water. So they can go supercritical at low slope, an slope angles, and since uh, many slopes in the natural environment are greater than about 0.45 degrees, density flows are prone to become supercritical and produce cyclic steps. And as uh, Arnaud and, and Mathieu pointed out in 2020, uh, subaqueous supercritical flows are not necessarily events uh, of exceptional energy. So let's take a look at the Mississippian. Uh, this was the age of crinoids, which was sandwiched uh, between two major extinction events at the end of the Devonian and at the end of the Mississippian. It's been proposed that crinoids did so well during the Mississippian uh, because uh, sea level was high. There was coastal upwelling that, that provided uh, food particles uh, for the, uh, the crinoids that lived in stenohaline conditions. Prior to this, the framework builders were active uh, during Devonian time. They developed uh, steep rimmed or steep margin rim platforms that restricted circulation to the interior of platforms. And so the crying noise were not as well developed in the interiors of platforms. And at the end of the Mississippi and ice house conditions uh, prevailed. So there was a more frequent and extreme changes in sea level, higher turbidity, uh, which was associated with the influx of fluvial deltaic systems that, uh, uh, that were not uh, helpful uh, to the development of the crinoid fauna. Now, in my area, uh, we're dealing with a, the cool water carbonate factory, a heterozoan uh, dominant system. Crinoids were present and abundant at all water depths. There was no restriction. Uh, they are 
oligophotic or aphotic uh, organisms that exist at, at the depths of which I'm seeing at maybe 150 meters up into the shallow waters. But they were probably most prolific, at least what I see in my outcrops, in the slope environments. So that with tremendous uh, productivity, there was shedding towards the basin via mass transport processes, sediment gravity flows, and I think also density cascades. And then, of course, there was likely uh, uh, reworking by, by contour currents. Now, let's talk a little bit about the crinoids themselves. They're stenohaline. Uh, they're passive suspension feeders, and so they rely on water movement to bring particles to them. The way they feed is that they, they basically bend their stalks in response to variations in current velocity and patterns. They bend down current. The arms uh, recurve into the current and catch particles, and it would be similar to me standing in a driving wind uh, rainstorm and holding an umbrella and, uh, and trying to catch food particles, if you were. So I'm dealing with very coarse sand to gravel size crinoidal grains. They're the most common, but they differ hydrodynamically from similar size quartz grains. Uh, the shapes are also different too, the pluricolumnal columns and disc-shaped columnals. And living crinoids, and shortly after they die and until they undergo the diagenetic alteration or uh, uh, overgrowth cementation, they have high intraskeletal porosity, you know, 50 to 70% or more. So they have an apparent specific gravity, much less than, than that of quartz. And so essentially, uh, they're equivalent to quartz grains with a diameter of less than one-tenth of the columnals. And that's pretty significant. But in the Fort Payne Formation, we have numerous graded turbidites, for example, like here with crinoid columnals, Raise, uh, ranging upward to two centimeters in diameter. And then in addition, we have these spectacular bed forms, such as these uh, climbing dunes that are made up of crinoid gravel, all of which uh, I think really indicates to me that the flows that were carrying this sediment were just about as powerful as those that carry siliciclastic sand. These are some of the folks who have attended or been out in the field with me. And so I just want to acknowledge them for all the uh, input encouragement that they have given me in uh, several full field trips into the field. Okay, well, let's set up the, the regional paleogeography. Uh, the study area is in the red rectangle here. Uh, it's bordering Kentucky and Tennessee. It was adjacent to the uh, Appalachian foreland basin and the advancing Borden Delta front, which is uh, early Mississippian in age. Uh, there was a, a a, a large carbonate platform that existed across the southern margin of Larusia, and it was occupying an area about 15 to 25 degrees uh, south latitude. Now, with this kind of a setup and the and the, uh, uh, the the surface currents and the uh, uh, coastal or the southeast trades, it set up uh, surface currents of, uh, that established a possibility for upwelling along the southern margin here, and that helps explain. Uh, the presence of many siliceous limestones and cherts along the southern margin, as well as glauconitic shales in the Fort Payne Formation in, in my study area. Not only that, but there was a very large platform interior or shelf environment. There are evaporites, salt, and anhydrite in Virginia. There's evaporites in the Michigan Basin of early Mississippian age, and that may have set up the possibility for cascading density currents that spilled basinward or across the platform and towards the basin and down into the basin and uh, uh, were maybe driving some of the sediment off slope to create some of the bed forms that I'm seeing. And then finally, I think there was probably uh, not much doubt that there were contour currents that were sweeping around uh, some of this topography during early Mississippian time. This is a very generalized stratigraphic chart that shows the framework for the, the lower to middle Mississippian interval, including the Fort Payne formation. Uh, here's the, the Borden Delta. It was largely a subaqueous delta. The shoreline was quite some distance uh, towards the, the, the northeast, or and that's mislabeled. It should say northeast. And uh, the, the Fort Payne developed during an early to middle Osagian sea level rise and uh, consists of a mixture of siliciclastic shales, some thin sandstones, and then carbonates, all of which prograded long distances basinward uh, into south central Kentucky and then down into to Tennessee. 
There were likely several third order cycles of relative sea level change during the Osagian uh, that uh, aided uh, the progradation across the long distances. Well, this is a surface geologic map of my study area shown here in the blue uh, polygon here, southern Kentucky and across Tennessee right down to the Alabama uh, border. The Fort Payne formation and uh, Mississippian is colored in blue and it wraps around the Nashville dome and the rocks gently, uh, dip gently towards the southeast under the route prop belt and under the Cumberland Plateau. Now, it's really fortunate because I not only have world-class outcrops along the outcrop belt, but there are thousands of well logs that have been uh, taken from exploration and production wells that were drilled underneath the Cumberland Plateau to exploit uh, hydrocarbons in the Mississippian and down into the Ordovician. So I can have the opportunity to integrate subsurface and surface, surface rock information locally and sub-regionally to develop, I think, what is a pretty robust uh, stratigraphic framework. So that dashed black line gives you a cross section I'll show you next. So you can see clearly see that there are clinothems that are prorating off uh, to the left of the diagram that include uh, funnel to, to bell patterns uh, uh, towards the, the north. There are upward coarsening and upward fining successions. The Fort Payne uh, extends from the, the datum here, the, the top of the, uh, the Fort of uh, Chattanooga Shale, and extends upward to about right in here, and it's overlined by the uh, Salem and Warsaw formations. The clinothems average about uh, less than a degree, but they're locally up to about eight degrees. Progradational mixed shale carbonate sediment gravity flow deposits. And then when you get into the bottom sets here in Tennessee, this is where we see all these large bottom set sediment waves. And the slopes are where we see four set sediment waves and, and gullies. So that obviously was constructed with uh, well log data. And so I have well log data from all across this area in here. And that's how I was able to construct this uh, isopac map. The, the thick interval up in here is uh, where the clinothems have developed and are prograding generally towards the south from the front of the board and shelf edge. It thins uh, towards the basin right along the, uh, the, the Tennessee and Kentucky border and uh, passes all the way down to the border with uh, uh, Alabama over a distance of a couple of hundred kilometers or so. And this is the area of bottom set sediment waves. Everything I've seen in the outcrop in here in terms of natural outcrops and quarries all the way down here consists of bottom set sediment waves, very large sediment waves. And these are the big clinoform, clinoforms up in here. So what I want to do is take you on a tour. Uh, we're gonna first look at uh, slope sediment waves uh, up here in the uh, middle to outer slope setting. Uh, I'm, and, and then we'll take a look at slope gullies, and then we'll go down into the bottom sets to look at these very large bottom set sediment waves. So we have a feeder system of slope gullies that are taking sediment down into the basin. And we also have sediment waves that are developed in the slope environments themselves, as well as the bottom sets. This uh, cross-section is basically taken very close to a series of outcrops that are going to take you on a quick tour of. So uh, four well logs, and you can see here that these are basically clinotherms that are prograding to from northeast to southwest. And so it stands to reason that what we see in the outcrop would reflect that as well. And so I'm going to show you an outcrop that's about 800 meters long, series of road cuts, number one, number two, number three. And you can see the geometry already in this particular road cut here, or a series of road cuts, but there's some variations. You see beds that are inclined to the south here and here, and then they reverse and are ascending to the south and here. And then at the next outcrop, the third outcrop, they're again descending towards the south. You can't see that in the well log cross section because of the long distances between these well logs. So we know that there's a lot more rugosity, a lot more detail that, that we can capture from the outcrop that we can't see in the well logs. So let's go to that outcrop, road cuts one, two, and three. And I believe that they basically represent 
portions of two sediment waves that were basically building or migrating to the south. Paleo flow is to the south across this distance of uh, 800 meters or so. There are four basic facies association here. Facies association wind, one is a coarsening upward four sets of shaley to uh, crinoidal wacky stones and flowstones and rudstones. Uh, facies association two are backset bedded rudstones. And both of these facies are present along the four sets or least side of this sediment wave and also repeated at the next four sets or least sides of this sediment wave. And in between, we see this association of facies association three, which is spectacular association of climbing uh, dunes composed of crinoidal gravel. And then facies association four, wavy bedded turbidites that, uh, that prograde out over the top compensationally above this underlying sediment wave. So let's focus in on the first road cut, number one. So this is an ob oblique view uh, of this particular road cut. This is the interpreted crest of that uh, sediment wave. Now we're going down the the, uh, the four set or the lee side. And these are the four sets. They consist of coarsening upward successions of, again, wacky stones, shaley wacky stones, and float stones up into shaley rud stones uh, towards the top. And then there's this very interesting wedge between the red and the orange in here that consists of backset bedded crinoidal rud stones and the insets here shows you that succession here. The red line here is that one. Here's the four sets, 10 degrees dip. And then we look at these coarse road stones and I've traced out the bedding uh, planes in here. And you can see that there's uh, a number of uh, bed set boundaries that look like they're prograding. Uh, Some of them are asymptotically, but most of them have a toe out uh, a tangentially against the underlying bed set boundaries. Each one of these fine upward, such as this, and they're all stepping towards the north, up slope and up flow. The next uh, road cut is several hundred meters long and everything changes. We see uh, facies association four, which are these wavy, wavy bedded turbidites uh, up in here. And then, uh, but most spectacularly is this interval in here that I want to focus on to show you some spectacular associations. This is a facies four or facies three, uh, essentially climbing dunes of crinoidal gravel. Uh, this succession is, is more than eight meters thick. Uh, it consists of entirely crinoidal shale at the base, coarsening upward into crinoidal gravel, uh, float stones and road stones toward the top. Uh, the, uh, the, the climbing angles of each one of these is about 10 to 20 degrees. And clearly the flows that were carrying this, this sediment, the clays and the crinoids were carrying a huge load in suspension and, and, and as bed loan and they rapidly decelerated, decelerated uh, uh, just as they began to develop these climbing dunes. This is a, a most unusual succession. Looking at it a little more closely, uh, we can see that uh, the, uh, the, the columnals are, are, are large. They're up to two centimeters in diameter. And they compose these individual dunes uh, that are clay rich on the four sets and more grainy on the, uh, the stoss sides. And they're each climbing upward uh, through these very uh, clay rich uh, uh, bed set boundaries. Now, how to, how to explain this? Uh, a few years ago, uh, McDonald and Jan uh, Alexander did an open channel flume experiment. Uh, it's open channel, so it's not uh, submerged uh, turbidity flow or density flow. But uh, what they did was was uh, experiment with a single hydraulic or, or jet flow, supercritical flow, and developed a hydraulic jump immediately downstream. And it deposited essentially sets of climbing dunes. Uh, and they call these hydraulic jump unit bars. And so these look almost identical to what I see in the outcrop. And so I'm suspecting that, that these spectacular climbing dunes were deposited immediately downflow from a large hydraulic jump and were deposited as climbing dunes, uh, just as we see uh, that were developed in this experiment. So this may be one of the first examples 
in the rock record of uh, large sets of climbing dunes associated with a hydraulic jump. Uh, that's going back to, again, just showing you the scale. And uh, I can tell you that each one of these people were, were just totally impressed with this particular outcrop. Okay, now we'll, we'll go down to the, the second uh, sediment wave. The crest of it looks almost identical to the one we saw at road cut number one. It has the same facies association of coarsening upward four sets and facies association two with the back sets. So a little bit more closer up, we can see the, the four sets, they're all coarsen upward, except for this wedge of back set bedded rudge stones that is pinching out and has uh, up, up slope and up uh, upflow migrating rudge stones. So that uh, again is suggesting that we're looking at uh, the crest, uh, two crests and, and a trough. So I took all of this together. We're only seeing a portion of each one of these sediment waves, but I thought there was enough information together that I could, to, to, could develop this uh, schematic model. So the core of each sediment wave essentially is a facies association one, coarsening upward four sets capped by rudge stones such as in the first sediment wave and the second sediment wave. Each one of them had backset bedded rudge stones that wedge out upslope that presumably developed in association with hydraulic jumps. And then one of the waves had these spectacular climbing uh, dunes composed of crinoidal rudge stones that was likely associated with a, a, a uh, hydraulic jump as well. And the scales of these, they're about 500 meters from crest to crest, and they uh, estimated to be able to have been about 20 meters high. Okay, now I want to shift basinward. Uh, we were uh, just north of the line up in here in southeast and south central Kentucky, but now we're going to go south to here and near Salina, Tennessee, and look at some slope gullies with crinoidal redstone and supercritical bed forms and, and mud waves. I'm really fortunate here because the road cut essentially parallels or nearly parallels and goes uh, 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 across uh, the inferred and depositional slope and the direction of flows. And so I've got three major road cuts here. I'm gonna show you uh, these three very quickly to, to show you the kinds of uh, geometries that we see in association with uh, strike oriented, obliquely oriented and nearly parallel oriented to the paleo flows. So here it is, a, a 3D photogrammetry model, and we've got these road cuts, and they're almost like wall, uh, driving down between canyons be, uh, in a canyon wall because there's opposing road cuts across both sides of the, the highway. And so we can infer uh, from tracing the gullies from one side of the outcrop to the other, the, the flow direction. These are the gully axes that I see on, on these particular road cuts. And I'm taking the, the definition by Juan Fedele, uh, in, in 2016, the gullies are linear downslope trending features of erosional depositional or of mixed nature. So road cut number two, a little bit closer view. Uh, these are the axes trends for each one of these uh, gullies from one side to the other, the blue dot associating to the corresponding other side. And they're each associated with mud antiforms. Take a little bit closer look in a, here in a bit. The gully fields are in here, filled with rudge stones, and the inferred flow is basically parallel to the axis trends of each one of these gullies. Looking at the, in an oblique, or I'm sorry, at a, an orthographic view here, uh, these are the rudge stone gullies in here, one, two, and three. There's another one here. And then these are mud waves of crinoidal mud rock. The gully dimensions are about 40 to 50 meters wide three to five meters deep or thick, and with these kinds of ratios of width versus depth. They're filled in with rud stones. Some of these look like Balma B uh, subdivisions. They're laminated, very coarse grained. You can make out the individual crinoids in here. They're basically rud stones and some grain stones as well. And then the uh, intervening or mud waves are, are basically crinoidal rud or mud rock the scattered to concentrated lags of uh, coarse crinoidal debris. In other places, it's uh, muddier facies of uh, finer silt and, 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 and silt size and fine sand size of, of carbonate 
uh, particles, skeletal grains, and perhaps mud with uh, current ripples, not as many uh, crinoids in this particular part of the mud rock. And now I want to take you up to this particular road cut. It's, it's almost parallel uh, to the flow, but slightly oblique, and we're going to see a, a very different geometry there. So this view is, again, looking almost uh, uh, parallel to the flow, looking due north, and uh, it's uh, obvious that there are four different architectural elements here that are laterally offset and each migrating upflow or upslope. Uh, architectural element number one, two, three, and four. And you can note also that uh, they have they have convex upward stratigraphic bedding in here that terminate against the lower surface. And there's also some forset bedding in here. Each one of these elements is roughly about 100 meters in length and about four meters thick in the axis in here. And then, of course, underneath, we have these mud waves composed of crinoidal mud rock. I was able to walk along the base here. I can't reach up in here because it's vertical. I could walk along in here and take inclinations uh, of these beds, and they were all basically uh, dipping towards the north or what is interpreted as the, uh, uh, the direction from which the flows were flowing. Now, here's an orthographic view uh, showing uh, the gully fills in here, laterally offset stacks of bed set bedded rudd stones. Convex upward, they built topography, and these successive architectural elements, I think, uh, migrated upflow. And uh, so these are the, uh, the stoff side back sets, and these are the lee side uh, four sets. Now, where can we go to find an analog to that? And for that, I'd, I'd like to compare this with the geometry of some spectacular modern cyclic steps composed of siliciclastic uh, sandy crescentic bed forms in the Squamish uh, Pro Delta Slope. These were beautifully documented by Sophie Hodge and, and Rebecca Englert just recently. And so note the, uh, the crescentic shapes of these bed forms within these slope channels. And from day to day, the shapes of these change indicated that the flows were uh, basically uh, active daily, uh, reworking and reforming these uh, crescentic bed forms uh, almost on a, on a daily basis. Uh, they took numerous uh, bathymetric surveys, and so uh, they were able to develop the bed form architecture by stacking up surveys daily. So here's the uh, uh, bathymetric map, map uh, of one of these particular channels on day five, and uh, the cross-section AA prime goes right down the axis or thaw leg of that particular channel, showing the geometry of these uh, crescentic uh, backstep bedded uh, cyclic step bed forms. Now, uh, I don't have anything quite like that, but I think that we compare cross section B, B prime and C, C prime with what I see in the aqua. So we can, we can readily see that B, B prime, which is taken uh, uh, basically uh, across uh, the flow in, in the Squamish Delta is very similar to this cross sectional view uh, looking up the slope or up the flow uh, for the gully field that I see in the Fort Payne. And so what about this section here? It's an oblique section. And I think that it is fairly similar to this portion of my cross section that is interpreted to have been uh, formed obliquely or almost parallel to the flow, just as, as similar to this oblique section that uh, Rebecca uh, uh, interpreted from her work in the Squamish Delta. Very similar kind of geometry, and so it seems to argue, in my, in my judgment, as something very similar to the uh, so cyclic steps uh, in, in the Port Payne. Now, there are mud waves in between and below here. What are these? Are they channel levees? Are they helical flow ridges? Are they contour rights? Uh, I, I, there's any number of these uh, might work. Uh, I, there's no real time to, to in, include each of these hypotheses, but I do want to show you one possible analog that is, uh, seems to fit fairly well. There have been a number of studies, uh, bathymetric surveys, uh, shallow bottom, uh, sub-bottom profiling along the Bahamas over the last uh, 12, 13 years or so, 
And all of these have shown that the slopes are intensely gullied. Little Bahama Bank, Great Bahama Bank, and the KSL Bank. And in this particular situation, or my case, I want to visit the KSL Bank because there are gullies, asymmetric ridges, and cyclic steps that, that may uh, help explain what we see in, the, in Fort Payne, particularly in this area up in here in the KSL Bank. This work was done by one shot et al. in, in 2017. And uh, at about uh, 250 to 300 meters in water depth on the middle slope, and what stands out to me are, are these numerous gullies, 60 to 100 meters wide, two to 10 meters deep. And the, the numbers of these that are scattered are, are occurring along the slope, and they're all pretty straight, slightly meandering and carrying sediment right down uh, to the slope, through the slope into the basin. Now, this view over here is, uh, is of the slope angle, and what stands out are the presence of cyclic step bed forms that occupy the thaw wigs of these channels. And so also, they've been able to document that there are contour currents in this area that are basically flowing from the north along the parallel to the slopes. And that might help explain the ridges that are present here. That cross section is here and uh, north, northwest, to southeast. And so here are the gullies that would be filled partially with cyclic steps. The contour currents are passing from left to right here or north, northwest to south. And uh, it, they think that that's what's forming these asymmetrical ridges with the, con with the cyclic steps, of course, uh, transmitting or transferring sediment from the platform uh, down the slope by way of uh, density cascades. So it looks very similar kind of the geometry that we see in, in the Fort Payne. Now, let's shift basinward. Let's go down into the bottom sets and see some extraordinary bottom set sediment waves. And for that, the, the best place to go is at a, uh, at a state park in Tennessee. And in this particular location here, uh, this is a LIDAR map showing the topography. And for, I have about four kilometers of continuous outcrop exposure on both sides of this river valley here exposures on the south side, exposures on the north side, that I can look at uh, over a swath of, again, about four kilometers. And it exposes a sediment wave train. The green lines represent the troughs of each sediment wave. I can see that trough on this side of the bank, turn around and see the same trough over here, and so forth and so on with the crest of each succeeding sediment wave. And so there are about a half a dozen sediment waves that I can visit and, uh, and document uh, over a swath of about uh, uh, four, meter, uh, four kilometers. So I'm going to take you to, to the first one in here. It's a very large sediment wave, and we'll make a transect. So this is, paleo flow is from left to right, northwest to southeast. Here's the trough. We start going up the Stawson here. The height of this is about 50 meters to 70 meters for the entire bluff in here, going up over the stoss to the crest with a minor trough, another crest in here, and then down the lee side of this wave that is more than 700 meters long. The next slide is going to be in the trough. We'll take a quick look at what the rocks look like right in here. So paleo flow is from left to right. You can make out the wavy type of bedding in here. There's a scale, 10 meters. So that's a pretty good sized cliff in here. They're composed of crinoidal rudstones, uh, some packed stones in there too. They're fairly heterolithic with some finer grain material that may be shaly. Uh, and what I've done is trace out the bed boundaries to, to distinguish what I think are back sets in violet color versus four sets in the uh, brown color or tan color. So these may be antidunes that developed in the troughs of this particular sediment wave. Now we're gonna go up the stoss side over the crest of the next sediment wave. The trough was far back in here, maybe, maybe 100 meters off the slide in here. And now we're at the crest and lee side of the next very large sediment wave. Uh, paleo flow was from left to right. And you can see that I've traced out all the beds in here and you can see 
two particular features in here that look very similar. And when we trace out those bed forms and the crust of them, we can see they show upslope migration counter to the flow, which was from left to right. So these appear to be upslope migrating, uh, migrating antidunes that develop on this large compound sediment wave. And note how everything is, is thinning basinward. And you can see too that how the beds thin uh, down the slope and in here, they thin out in here. And I think that represents a supercritical flow through greater than one uh, uh, to supercritical conditions. And what happens down in here when we reach the bottom? It looks like sort of a normal condensed section, but we're dealing with high velocity flows. And so that condensation is due to uh, supercritical flow accelerating, re removing sediment, perhaps developing a hydraulic jump uh, down slope. It's not due to suspension settling of fine grained sediment that we normally think of in a condensed section. So about 100 meters down slope or down uh, flow from here, this is what we encounter. Two absolutely spectacular climbing and aggradational sediment waves. There's a person for scale right here. And so a climbing asymmetric wave located here and an aggradational symmetric wave associated here. Looking at the climbing sediment wave, I was able to measure a section going up right along this yellow dashed line which is shown in here. And we see a number of sharp based finding upward beds and bed sets. It looks like it's overall finding upward into about right in here, which corresponds to this interval. And then these are subset photographs looking down the four slopes of each one of these uh, relatively thick bedded uh, intervals of, of pack stones and uh, to wacky stones that are somewhat heterolithic caps uh, with shaley type material. Then the next one is the aggradational sediment wave, uh, measured section, I could get right in here. This is all overhanging, so of course I can't reach it, but it's coarsening upward, and it tends to be wavy bedded in here with crinoidal rudstones, and coarsens upward and probably into more rudstones than here from these uh, muddier heterolithic facies. Uh, measured section here, there appear to be some uh, uh, small antidunes that are developed in this heterolithic facies in here. And there are some wavy rippled uh, redstones and pack stones down in here with a very sharp base at the bottom. There's the, the title slide that shows the Twin Falls aggradational sediment wave with paleo flow from right to left. Now, further down up, up, the, up the stream or uh, uh, up, I'm sorry, down flow, paleo uh, flow wise. Uh, we lose the cliffs, but and so we we were able to actually walk across the tops of these uh, large scale sediment bed forms and sediment waves. And so uh, this is scale over 50 meters, and so we we can walk from the stoss side of of one sediment wave over the crest and down the upper lee slope of this next sediment wave to to see uh, what is present. Slightly different view, more uh, orthogonal. Uh, and so it shows uh, the Stoss side going up over the crest right in here and down the lee side. And there's a remarkable facies change across from here. I want you to, to, to pay attention to the interval between the brown line right here or the brown surface and the blue surface right here, which is replicated in here. So over a, a lateral distance of about uh, 30 or 40 meters or so, we changed from crinola grainstones and rudstones in here that are planar laminated, that look like upper flow regime beds, and they pass down dip into a succession of crinoidal rudstones that appear to have upslope inclined or backset bedded rudstones, as well as some uh, downslope uh, foreset bedded uh, uh, rudstones as well. Looking a little bit closer, these are the laminated rudstones located in here, look like Bauman B uh, traction carpets. And then these are the backset bedded crinoidal rudstones. You can clearly make out uh, the uh, inclined bedding that is uh, uh, terminating against these underlying uh, bed set boundaries. And this is true depositional dip. Uh, that's, that's no tectonic distortion at all. It's about uh, eight degrees or so. And you can see this is, this is really quite thick, about four meters thick or so. So taking those bottom set sediment waves, and, and this is a, a schematic model, although it's based on real data, I traced off uh, some of those uh, sediment waves and, and, and uh, schematically drew this up. 
But these are the kinds of features that we see. The sediment waves tend to coarsen upward from shale and carbonate towards the base. Uh, they include uh, wavy bedded uh, rudstones in the troughs, as well as uh, backset bedded rudstones in the troughs. Uh, there are aggradational and, and uh, backset, I'm sorry, upslope migrating sediment waves. Some of these appear to have been associated uh, with uh, upslope migrating antidunes. And there are actually some prograding rudstones uh, that may indicate some uh, uh, flow separation and uh, down current migrating, uh, uh, perhaps supercritical dunes. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I think there's evidence here that suggests that we have clinothems uh, in this distally steep and ramp that consist of uh, gullies in the slope and they pass down dip into large sediment waves. There are also sediment waves here in the, in the slope environment too, and they occupy an area of, of more than 20,000 square kilometers. The gullies are, are filled with supercritical flow rudstones and they're flanked by mud waves that may have been uh, formed by uh, contour currents. And uh, I think that I'd rather change the term here to one that is process oriented. It's a gullied sediment wave ramp. It indicates that this ramp was very dynamic. The basin floor was equally dynamic, and it doesn't fit any of the existing ramp models that I learned about or I've worked with uh, over, over my, my long career. It can't be unique, and so I think it suggests that we need to consider other options, uh, including more dynamic processes in ramps that have been previously interpreted as a uh, uh, typical sort of uh, low energy or, or storm dominated ramps that pass upward into uh, uh, low energy settings. So I appreciate your time and I hope that uh, some of us or maybe all of us at some point can, can meet on the outcrop. Thanks uh, so much for your attention. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. Uh, so uh, just a reminder to all the guests, uh, is now open for uh, you all to type your questions. Uh, so please mention where you are watching from and send questions to everyone. Uh, from Paul Wright of Cardiff. Um, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. Uh, so Paul Wright from Cardiff uh, asked if the COBE have any effect on the slope system? Uh, Paul, refresh me. What is COBE? <laughs> uh, okay, so un, um, Kobe. until, um, yeah, Paul actually answers that. I'll just ask, uh, go over to the next question. Uh, 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 so this is in Have you had a chance to tackle the shale code Valsortian mounds at the Cumberland? Is that how it fit in? Yes, uh, Pete. Nice to nice to see you. Nice to hear from you. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't want to open up a can of worms, but. Uh, I have some doubts about whether at least some of those are actually Walsortian type mounds. Uh, just uh, last month, I went to one of the so-called Packstone mounds that was uh, uh, worked on by, by Dave Meyer and, and, and uh, Bill Osich. And from what I can tell, uh, all of the, the, the shale cord intervals and what I see in other outcrops too, they're basically muddy sediment waves. And the grainy intervals are the rudstones and pack stones and grain stones that are migrating over the tops and associated with the sediment waves themselves. So uh, I tend to think that there's a lot more evidence for hydrodynamic activity in many of these features that, that Dave and Bill worked with than as opposed to strictly biohermal uh, buildup. Uh, okay. 
Uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, and in reference to Paul's question uh, before, Kobe uh, refers to the Kinderhuken or Sargen, the greater 120 meter sea level fall. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't quite understand the acronym. Uh, these rocks are uh, slightly younger than that major sequence boundary and sea level fall. Uh, the entirety of the Borden is considered to have been Kinderhookian, and uh, so there was probably there was a sea level fall associated with that. But I'm not sure it's reflected in the Fort Payne, which is uh, again almost the entire uh, Osagean. There are siliciclastics uh, associated with some parts of the Fort Payne, but they appear to have been formed or deposited during the Osagean as opposed to the end of the Kinderhookian. So I can't answer that directly, but uh, you would expect to see that. I, by the way, I do see that in the Kinderhookian and Osagian and other parts of North America, especially in Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, sure. Uh, so we have another question from Eva Drivet. Uh, so she, uh, she comments, excellent, very informative talk and amazing outcrop. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and the question is, any production from some of the wells in zones equivalent to features you documented uh, from the outcrop? If so, any thoughts on what may help these crinoidal cases? I'm, I'm, really glad, I'm really glad to hear that question because yes, uh, there is extensive production from the Fort Payne in Northeastern Tennessee. And uh, in the, I believe it was in the eighties, uh, an ex uh, a deceased professor at University of Kentucky by the name of Bill McQuown published an APG on these rocks and he interpreted all the production as being Walsordian type mounts. Uh, the maps that he showed showed orientations northeast southwest that basically parallel some of the orientations of the sediment waves I've seen in the outcrop. So having not seen the rocks and cores but looking at the ISOPAC maps that I generated, I think that this was a, 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 a incorrect interpretation that they're all sediment waves. Uh, thanks. Uh, and then there's one more question right now. Uh, again, a gentle reminder to the guests, uh, you, the chat box is open and you can type in your questions and I'll read them out. Uh, but the question from Jeff may Uh, are you there? I, I think she froze up. So I'm going to go ahead and answer a question that came from Jeff May. Uh, Jeff asked me, how were these uh, bed forms uh, explained previously? Just as crinoidal buildups question. And uh, yes, the, the, the large scale bed forms that I showed you in the latter part of the talk, uh, the ones that were 700, 800 meters long, they were interpreted by USGS geologists in about 1962 as bioherms. Uh, well, there is nothing biohermal about it. Everything in those rocks is, uh, uh, is basically hydrodynamic transported carbonate. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what I see in the rocks. I think we lost her again. Uh, Uh, Stephen, are you there? Can you pick up on this? Oh, yeah, I'm back again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I think I have network issue problems. Um, uh, okay, so that seems to be the questions as far as I see. Um, just a reminder to the guests again, if you have any questions, please do put it in the chat box and I'll read them out. Uh, but then I just have a small question. I mean, sure. it's, uh, it's a silly question probably. Um, my question would be, um, do we have modern, and so you talked about the mud waves and uh, we have the modern analogs in uh, terms of Bahamas. Do we have the same thing for uh, the hydraulic dumps too? So the, those, um, Forms that you showed the bed set. Do we do we have other examples elsewhere? You said or um, yes, 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 yes. 
Have a great day. Uh, yeah, uh, the Maldives has uh, cyclic steps uh, in some of the uh, sub-bottom uh, profile so that I've seen in the literature. They've not been extensively studied, but uh, certainly they're there in, in some of the work that was published uh, a few years ago. Uh, I don't know of others. Oh, I take it back. The uh, Great Australian Bight is a fantastic example of large scale transverse sediment waves that were developed uh, off uh, the end of the slope environment. They have lots of bryozoans as a heterozoan cool water factory. An interesting story about that, some years ago, uh, Noel James, one of the most highly respected carbonate sedimentologists uh, uh, who have graced our presence, and, and one of his, his co-author, Fury, interpreted on the basis of 2D data and, and cores, uh, bryozoan mounds uh, in the Great Australian Bight. Well, fast forward a couple of years later, a few years later, and Andrew Scoff and others, they had uh, bathymetric surveys that showed that no, these are not mounds, they're actually transverse sediment waves, cyclic steps. So there's a case when you, when you don't have enough data, especially three-dimensional data, you can misinterpret features as mounds simply because of their composition, uh, and, and when in fact they turn out to be sediment waves. Okay. Um, there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Uh, so then I think I'll just wrap up the session if that's okay with you. It's fine. Um, oh, all right. Um, Okay, uh, so with this, we have come to the end of uh, this week's Ed's online webinar and also for the entire web se uh, se sessions for this year. So don't forget to join us on the 10th of January, 2024, the next year, uh, where Thomas Dodd will provide insights on the um, hybrid event beds in the context of ancient deep lacquer string fan models. See you then. Happy holidays and see you on the 10th of January.